thing just, you know, and, and the dead were judged and there was found no place of them. You know, the heaven and earth fled before him and all that kind of stuff. That's when the elements melt with a fervent heat and everything's just destroyed. That's at the Battle of Gog and Magog, Revelation 20. All right, somebody else got a Bible question. Anybody want to double dip? Got another Bible question. All right, Revelation chapter number 10. Revelation chapter 10. All right, we looked at uh, last week, we looked at the... um, The um, devil worship and the uh, um, the things going on during the tribulation in verse number twenty and twenty one, and uh, now we pick up in chapter ten. Chapter ten is a parenthetical chapter. All right. So what you got to understand about Revelation is it's not chronological. That is the biggest thing that people get blundered with is Revelation is not chronological. It's not a storybook that you start in Revelation one and read all the way through the Revelation 21 and try to make a timeline. It starts over. There are parenthetical chapters. There are different things going on. So that's why the need to rightly divide is so important, okay? Now look at Revelation 10, verse number 1. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. Now this is the Lord, okay? This is Jesus Christ. You say, well, Jesus Christ isn't an angel. Well, he absolutely is an angel. He's called the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, right? Okay, so notice, and he had in his hand a little book open. And he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot on the earth and cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth and when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. If you want to see what those thunders are, uh, you can go back to Revelation, excuse me, Revelation, Proverbs chapter 29, okay? Proverbs 29 records uh, seven thunders. It doesn't say what they, what they say, all right? But there's going to be seven thunders uttered, all right? Verse 4, and when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. So we find here in the uh, in chapter ten that there are ten sayings. So Jesus Christ comes down. He's got one foot on the earth, one foot on the sea, and he's got a little book open. Now, more than likely, that little book that's opened is the book of Daniel. Look at Daniel chapter twelve, verse four. Daniel chapter twelve, verse four. All right, Daniel chapter 12 and verse 4. Notice what it says there. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall be increased. So Daniel, the book of Daniel, it is the smallest of the major prophets, okay? So that could be why he said he had a little book in his hand. And you notice here that Daniel's told to take what he's written and seal it up in a book until the time of the end. So there's a truth here that you gotta that you gotta understand that we as Bible believers, you know, we really pushed, Dr. Ruckman really pushed it. It's something called advanced revelation or progressive revelation, okay? Uh, technically those things could be two different things, but let's let's focus on progressive revelation. Revelation, all right? Progressive revelation is the, is the idea that as we get closer to the end of time, God is going to reveal more and more truth to us about fr- from the pages of scriptures about the things that are taking place. Who has a Schofield Bible this morning? Anybody got a Schofield Bible? No? I, I don't think my Schofield Bible's up here. Um, man alive, huh? Yeah, I don't think it's in here. Everybody's got Rutman reference Bibles almost, if it's a reference Bible in here. But anyway, in the Schofield reference Bible, it's interesting. Before each book of the Bible, Schofield would write a little synopsis about the book. 
And interestingly enough, in his synopsis of Revelation, the very last sentence is that, um, it, it says this, he said, Doubtless much which is designedly obscure to us shall be revealed to those to whom it applies. You know what he's saying? He's saying that the things that right now are obscure to us in the book of Revelation will be more clear to those that are going to that it's going to apply to. So what he was saying, for example, like what Michael was talking about this morning, how could how could how could all the world see two people lying in the streets in the middle of Jerusalem? Well, that's not a hard thing for us to understand or comprehend at all. But in the days of C.I. Schofield, 1917, when he wrote his reference Bible, that was a hard truth to understand. How in the world could that happen, right? How could how could all the kings of the east be gathered, you know, in in in, in, in such a short time for the battle of, of Armageddon? How could they get all the troops there in such a short time? Uh, we, you understand that it's not complicated for us anymore. I mean, transatlantic flights weren't even invented yet in 1917. You know, all these things you got to understand that uh, that Schofield and Darby and Larkin and all those guys, there was stuff that they began to see and understand. I think it's interesting. 1830 is when Darby really started, uh, really started pushing. You know, the the pre-tribulational rapture. Of course, the pre-tribulational rapture was not invented by Darby. People have believed that for centuries. You can go back and look at it, and we won't take time to look at it this morning. But Darby, the, the really started becoming popular in the eighteen in eighteen thirty, and 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 that time period. Well, notice what does Daniel say? Daniel says that that book, the book of Daniel, shall be sealed up until the time of the end. And the two signs of the end are people shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. So increase knowledge and increase transportation. Interestingly enough, 1830 and that time period is when we first started developing the railroad system. We were now able to go from one end of the country to the other through the railroad system and all that kind of stuff. So you got to understand that book is a unique book. Uh, you, when you look at it, I have a message I preached a long time ago. I mean, it's probably been three or four years ago now. But I talk about this stuff. I think it's online. I preached it at Brother Gunther's about how in, in 1914, uh, when Clarence Larkin put out Dispensational Truth, that was the same year that World War I began. And World War I was the first war to use airplanes and army tanks, increased transportation and knowledge. And then 1917 is when Schofield put out his Bible. That was the year of the Balfour Declaration, where uh, the Prime Minister of England basically allowed the Jews to re-enter the land of Israel. It was the, called Palestine then. Same year. 1918 uh, is when... Uh, I'm sorry, 1918... I, I'm getting my dates confused here. 1918 is when Clarence Larkin put out Dispensational Truth, and that was the start of World War I with the, um, with the uh, um, uh, tanks and airplanes. So notice, as we get closer and closer to the coming of Jesus Christ, these things are going to start making more sense to us. That's called progressive revelation. That's why when people say, well, look back 500 years ago, nobody believed in that 500 years ago is what makes you right. Well, the fact is, is that as we get closer and closer, God's going to reveal more and more things to us. The Bible's going to start making more and more sense. There are things in the Bible that don't make sense to us. You know why? Because they're not for us. I mean, these obscure passages in the Old Testament that talk about seven shepherds raising up and, you know, that there's going to be saviors come, lowercase s-a-v, you know, saviors that are going to come. We don't understand some of that stuff. You know, the four carpenters in the book of Micah, I think it is. What is that What is that talking about? The four carpenters that are going to come. We don't understand. Yes, yeah, some, somebody, somebody thinks he knows what it's talking about, but he don't know. Anyway, yeah, somebody thinks he knows. But all this kind of stuff, it, you got to understand there's things in the Bible that we don't understand and we never will understand. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Because they don't apply to us. They're going to apply to tribulation saints. That's called progressive revelation. So Jesus Christ here has got the book of Daniel in his hand, the little book. 
and it's open. Uh, somebody once said that what Daniel sealed, John revealed. All right? What Daniel sealed, John revealed. So there's seven thunders they utter, and John, John was getting ready to write them down. He was getting ready to write down what these seven thunders uttered. And the angel said, nope, don't write them down. Seal up those things, verse 4, which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. Verse 5, and the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth, lifted up his hand to heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever who created heaven and the things that are therein, uh, excuse me, and the things that therein are, and the earth and the things that therein are. Did you notice that little nugget of truth right there? The heaven and everything that's in the heavens and the earth and everything that's in the earth. What in the world did he create that's inside the earth? I'm telling you, the Bible, when you start looking at the Bible more and more and terminology like that, there are things going on under the interior of our earth or in the interior of our earth that we probably won't know until we get to heaven or Jesus comes, okay? And the sea and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. Verse 7, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. You can find the mystery of God also recorded in Colossians chapter number 2. It's the mystery of God, the mystery of the ages. All right, things are beginning to get fulfilled. Things are finishing up. Verse number 8. And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went to the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. All right? And I took the little book out and of the angel's hand and ate it up, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. Now notice here, what he, the, the, the interpretation here, the, the spiritual truth you get out of this is quite good. This makes good preaching right here. The Bible is compared to honey. Oftentimes the Bible is compared to honey. That's Psalms 19, Psalms 119. Uh, Proverbs chapter, I can't remember, but it says, you know, when you eat honey, eat sufficient for you, lest you vomit it up, okay? Have you ever been reading the Bible? And uh, it's sweet, man. I love the Bible. The Bible will encourage you, but then the Bible gets down inside of you and it gets bitter. You say, why? Because it starts showing you who you really are. It starts convicting you. It starts telling you where to change this, that, or the other. And you got to be careful. I, I was studying this this past week at camp. You got to be careful about being occupied with strong meats. The Bible's a great book. Dig into the Bible, read the Bible, let it get in you. But you got to be careful about obsessing over doctrine and obsessing over deep things because what ends up happening is is that stuff will start making you sick. Have you ever met somebody, you know, much you know what did what did uh, uh, was it Gripper or Felix said to Paul much study hath made thee what? Mad. All right, crazy. Okay? With much knowledge, there is much sorrow. sorrow okay, so you got to be careful with that stuff. When you're, I, I'm not listening. I, in this day and age, I don't say stuff like that often because under the Lord, we need for more people to study, not you know less study. But we're in a Bible believing church. We got Bible students in here. Be careful that you, the Bible says for it is a good thing that the heart be established with what grace and not with strong meat, wherein some have you know been occupied therein. It's good for you to be established with grace. It's kind of like the principle of uh, you ever met somebody that knew the Bible, but they were a complete jerk. I mean, nobody could stand to be around them. You know, you got these guys that, you know, I mean, they know more Bible than, 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 than most, but, I mean, they've never won anybody to the Lord. Yeah. Or these guys that, you know, uh, man, they, they, just, they know the Bible perfectly and, and they, you know, just, uh, just have all this Bible knowledge and, Yet, you know, they, they can't hardly tie their own shoes and stuff like that or, you know, don't brush their teeth and never comb their hair and, you know, don't take baths and all this stuff. You know, preacher, I'm talking about preachers, man. You know, Bible-believing preachers, pastors. The reality of it is is that, you know, have a balance in your Christian life, all right? Because that, what, that does that honey, it's sweet to the taste. Boy, it's good to learn all this stuff and it's good to dive in there. But that stuff gets bitter inside of you if you don't watch that thing. All right, that's why the Bible says eat, eat honey that's sufficient lest thou vomit it up. 
All right? It's sweet to the taste, but you got to be careful with it, okay? So, and, and also the principle of that stuff gets down inside of you. That Bible get inside of you, and it'll become bitter. It'll, it'll really start... Me- Listen, you ever, you ever been in a service, and man, the service was good, you enjoyed the preaching, and then you go home, and all of a sudden something the preacher said starts eating away at you? Or truth starts eating away at you. It gets bitter. See, that's how the Bible works. Verse number 11, and he said unto me, now here's something interesting, you ready? Here's something real, 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 real interesting, you ready? And he said unto me, thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. Now, there are a lot of different interpretations and opinions on what this means. Some people say that John, that the book of Revelation is is John's testimony before kings and nations and all that kind of stuff. It might be. But it also could be. I'm going to give you a little uh, interstitial theology here. Okay, look at Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter number 17. I mean 16. Matthew 16. So John is told that he's going to prophesy again before many people and nations and tongues and kings. All right? Now, it could be that it's the book of Revelation that he wrote. But he's the one prophesying, and he's, he's going to be before all these people. Look what it says in Matthew 16, verse 27. For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. That's the second advent, right? Verily I say unto you, there be some, excuse me, some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his what? Kingdom. Now, some people will say, well, that happened in chapter 17 at the Mount of Transfiguration. You know the only problem with that? The kingdom didn't come. He wasn't coming in his kingdom. There weren't angels with him. They, they it's not, he doesn't, he doesn't reward every man. He, that's not the same thing. Well, it was a picture of it. Well, that's fine. But like I've said before, if I'm drowning, throw me a rope, not a picture of a rope, all right? <laughs> so look at it now. People say, uh, you know, well, that's talking about John. John did see the coming, right? And he did, but notice what it says. There be some of you, not one of you. There be some of you. Notice what Jesus says in John 21. Look at John 21. All right, look at John chapter 21 and verse number 20. John chapter 21 and verse number 20. Then Peter, turning about, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved following, which also leaned on his breast at supper and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? Peter, seeing him, now who's this talking about? John, right? Peter, seeing him, saith to Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? Jesus saith unto him, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. Then went this saying abroad among the brethren that, uh, that that disciple should not die. Yet Jesus said not unto him, he shall not die, but if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? This is the disciple which testified these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. So notice, Jesus never says that John will not die. But he does open up the possibility that John will tarry until he what? Comes. Now, if John is going to once again, so there's going to be some that are not going to taste of death until Jesus Christ comes back the second advent. Jesus told Peter, if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? We never find the death of John recorded. We never find him getting off Patmos. And also, he is told there on the Isle of Patmos, he says, you're once again going to prophesy before all these, you know, people. Could be. I'm not solid on this. It's just a theory I have. It could be that John never tasted of death and that John's going to show back up again in the tribulation period. Could be. Now, we know the two witnesses are who? 
Moses and Elijah. All right? But it could be that John shows back up at some point during the tribulation period and begins to prophesy. It could just be that the book of Revelation is what it is. But there's some interesting verses that, uh, that, that, tend, that make me think that possibly John never died and he's going to show back up. Somebody said, well, so, well, you know, one of these smart alecks that, you know, just think that, you know, soul winning is the only thing you ought to talk about. He said, that, well, where's John now, Brother Sluter? I say, he's probably in Jerusalem drinking a cup of coffee. You know, I don't know where he's at. <laughs> like we got to know where he's at in order for this thing to be true, you know, that kind of stuff. Good night. Anyway, all right. Any comments, questions, or concerns? All right, let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you for your mercy and grace, Lord. Thank you for letting us be in church this morning. Thank you for Sunday school. Thank you for your book. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you are dismissed. Well, thank you. Is that weird enough for everybody?